You're listening to Tech Forward. I'm your host, Cheryl Chotrani. I'm a tech founder, developer, investor, and an industry enthusiast. And I believe that diversity can transform businesses and improve the world we live in. The Tech Forward podcast is a place for tech entrepreneurs, executives, venture capitalists, and diversity champions to share their stories, insights, and visions of the future. Together, we'll discuss the path to improving representation for women, minorities, and other underrepresented groups. What challenges, strategies, and possible solutions will shape the road ahead? Let's find out together. Hello, listeners. I'm delighted to bring to you today's episode of Tech Forward. Today, I'm speaking with Jared Tingle, a co-founder and managing partner of Harlem Capital Partners, an early-stage investment firm focused on supporting female and minority entrepreneurs. Jared has been featured in Forbes and Black Enterprise. He's completing his MBA at Harvard Business School, and he brings to his firm years of prior experience in private equity and investment banking at ICV Partners and Barclays. We'll be talking about how he and his three co-partners set out to diversify the landscape of entrepreneurs receiving venture funding and how they plan to support 1,000 founders from underrepresented backgrounds over the next 20 years. It's going to be a really fascinating conversation. So let's get started. Hi, Jared. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. Hi, thank you very much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Well, I was thinking we could just start out by just having you share a little bit about your career journey and how you got into venture. Sure. So it all started back in undergrad. I went to the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. And there I studied econ and finance and had several financial related internships. So that's kind of how I first became aware of business opportunities and investment career path. After school, I ended up working at Barclays in the technology, media, and telecom group, where I worked for two years. That was under investment banking. And then I made the decision to switch to more of an investment role. So ended up at ICB Partners in New York, which is a middle market private equity firm. They do generalist investments, and this is a pretty cool place because they were also Black-owned. But at ICV, I started there in 2015. I also started investing or angel investing with a few friends on the side. We were first doing it because we realized there was a lot of disruption and innovation happening. And we really wanted to take part in that. Mm -hmm. And so we were doing it for fun, but also, you know, for potential financial rewards. But soon after we did that, we realized that there was a lack of funding or rather a small percentage of VC and angel funding was going to people of color, women entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So we saw that as a big opportunity. And on the flip side, on the investment front, at venture capital firms themselves, women and people of color are also extremely underrepresented. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we thought that, you know, by formalizing our brand and investment strategy, we can potentially help fund more diverse entrepreneurs and hopefully make a huge change in this industry. Wonderful. So let's talk about the impetus behind Harlem Capital Partners a little bit. How did you guys get started? And are the four partners now of the firm the same people that you were angel investing with before? And how did you guys come together? I'll handle your question in parts. I guess on the inspiration front, the biggest inspiration was the private equity firm, ICD Partners, that me and and Henri were working at when we started Harlem Capital. Mm -hmm. This place is unique because it was black owned. And really that was an inspiration to see that there are people that look like us only maybe, you know, 10 to 20 years older that are having a lot of success. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a great reputation and are able to execute very well. But I guess on the flip side, they originally, when they started about 20 years ago, they wanted to invest in women and people of color. But what they found was it's kind of challenging to do it in that asset class because the companies you invest in, you know, have to have over $10 million in EBITDA mm-hmm. or profits or $20 million in revenue. Mm-hmm. And there's just not that many people of color, women that are running um, businesses of that size, at least enough to create, you know, opportunity for a fund exclusively focused on that. Okay. But we realized if we focus on moving upstream in early stage investing, we could potentially be able to achieve this mission. And so that's really what got us started. I guess to your next question, no, there's been a little bit of churn. So Henri, Brandon, and I, we've all been around since the beginning. We had a few partners 
drop off because originally we were just doing it for fun. We didn't realize that we wanted to have a venture fund from the outset. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a natural attrition as it became more time intensive and as it became a bigger deal, if you will. Yeah. A lot of the best things start as hobbies sometimes or side projects and then turn into something really serious and much larger than you were expecting originally. Absolutely. And I'm rebranding and I are all friends that made it a lot of fun. And we also brought on John Henry Mm -hmm. at January of 2017. And so I think what makes us special, um, if we were going there, is just our work ethic. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, we're probably in 99 percentile when it comes to how hard we work. And we've also had kind of an outside level of success at every stage. And also, we have a very diverse set of skills that complement each other well. For example, Henri and I are very strong on the finance, investing, analytical side. And Brandon and John are very strong on the entrepreneurship and marketing side. Mm -hmm. And so we have a balanced kind of left and right brain um, components of our team. We're also very savvy at using social media. Brandon right now has about 130,000 followers on Instagram. John has north of 60,000 followers. Wow. And so we're really good at, you know, using social media, building, maintaining following, and then using it to our advantage to help raise awareness about our brand, our mission, and then also use that to, to generate deal flow. Okay. So you talked a little bit about the lack of diversity in the venture capital sector itself. And knowing, I think the latest stats that I saw were that only 2% of venture capitalists are Black. So with you guys being, you know, an all-Black team of four partners and Black men in the sector, knowing how underrepresented you guys are, did that discourage you at all coming in? Did you see that as an obstacle or an opportunity? What has that experience been like? That's a great question. I've I've actually seen some studies that said it was even lower, like (laughs) around 1%. But either way, it's a very dire situation. Mm -hmm. It didn't scare us away. If anything, it made us want to pursue this opportunity more aggressively. Mm -hmm. When you think about Black people making up, you know, 13% of the country, maybe even a little bit more, 14% of the workforce, and, you know, a comparable number of some professional service roles, comparing that with the lack of representation in venture capital, it's hard to believe that, you know, we don't have the capacity. I think there's some structural and informal things that have made it harder for us to rise through the ranks. But what that meant to us is that, hey, there's definitely deals and opportunities that are getting missed because venture capital is, you know, dependent upon networks. It's dependent upon relationships. And if you have very high quality women and entrepreneurs of color who are trying to present to VC firms, and the VC firms aren't able to relate or aren't able to assess these people accurately or find talent because they don't have as much in common with them. We think that, you know, their bias will inhibit them from having the success that, that is possible. As a result, we just doubled down and said, Hey, we're going to do this unapologetically. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say it probably did discourage us from pursuing a more formal path of working at a venture capital firm for 10 to 15 years. Mm-hmm. We thought that it would take so long and there was so little representation. We didn't think we would necessarily be treated fairly mm-hmm. um, in that process. We thought it was much more efficient and effective to have our own firm. And a lot of external factors kind of validated that. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's probably one of the reasons why entrepreneurship in the black community is on the rise. You know, there's a high spirit for entrepreneurship and your experience speaks to that a lot, too. So you guys have a goal of investing in 1,000 diverse founders over the next 20 years. At least that's what I read on your website. And that's a very, very specific goal. So I'm curious as to how you got to that number specifically. Yes, that's still definitely the goal. But as we started out, we knew we wanted to invest and support as many people of color, women entrepreneurs as possible. But we decided to pick a specific number and time frame around our goal to make it measurable. And we really wanted to have a clear, concise message that we can communicate externally. And we also think it helps us kind of reaffirm our long-term commitment because at least when you court potential investors and funds, to say pension funds, endowments, high net worth individuals, they really want to get comfortable if the team is committed and is willing to do this for decades. Um, they're not going to want to invest in a fund that's only going to be around for one or two funds. Mm-hmm. And so we think it's important from an investor perspective, but also just broadcasting that hey, founders of color, women founders, we're here for you and we're trying to do this. And the nice thing about venture capital is that um, even though there's always a level of competition in investing 
in every deal, you'll have multiple venture capitalists and angels. And so we're actually better off if there's more people that are starting funds that have similar missions. So we're really trying to not just take over the market, but also grow the pie. Mm-hmm. And we think by you know boldly stating what we're trying to do, hopefully it can inspire our peers and people younger than us to help join our mission. And perhaps actually inspiring more people to become entrepreneurs, right? If they know that there's possibly access to funding. Absolutely. And I wanted to touch on your, your point about you know how we're going to achieve it. It's pretty simple. I don't see it as being much different than other investment strategies, except that you know we just put a specific number around it. But it's, it's finding outside capital or continuing to find outside capital. It's sourcing good investment opportunities. It's investing diligently. And then it's making great returns for our shareholders. Um, that are aligned with our mission. And then if we have success, we'll just repeat and do it over and over again. Mm-hmm. And so in terms of our timeline, we expect to invest in potentially 60 deals over the next four to five years. But then we foresee a step change as we raise more money, we'll build our team and we'll invest in more and more deals. And that will allow us to get to the thousand founder mark in about 20 years. We're also making an assumption that the average deal has 1.5 to 2 founders on average. Mm-hmm. And so that helps. Um, it's not like we have to invest in necessarily a thousand separate companies, um, but at least 500 separate companies supporting those diverse founders. Got it. So obviously, Harlem Capital Partners has the word Harlem in your name. So that signifies a connection to New York. And I know you guys are based in New York. So are you focusing geographically on that area? What was kind of behind the decision to include Harlem in your name? As you, you touched on, we're based in New York. At the time, all the partners were living in Harlem. Mm-hmm. And we thought this is a place, or we know this is a place, such a rich, long history that makes people think of Black excellence, mm-hmm. empowerment, the arts. It's also a very popular, thriving Latino community as well. Mm-hmm. And so as a result, we felt like this name will make it very clear of where we're from, what we're trying to do. And by naming ourselves after, you know, one of the most inspiring places of Black culture, we had no choice but to succeed. But we're not solely focused on Harlem or New York investments, though we love entrepreneurs and love to support entrepreneurs in the area. Overall, we're agnostic to the U.S. And we think there's a lot of opportunities outside of the Bay Area in New York where most venture capital dollars go. Mm-hmm. So we've invested in companies in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, obviously, Baltimore, and San Diego to date. Um, but we really think there's an opportunity, not just investing in women and um, people of color, but also finding regions in the U.S. where there's obviously a lot of talent, a lot of robust managers, but that just haven't received as much venture capital because the firms aren't based there and they haven't been focused there. Mm-hmm. So we think that through our social media outreach, which is, we think, a unique differentiator for us, um, but also just being willing to be on the ground and go to these other markets, we think we'll be able to have investments that are more representative of the geographies in the U.S. Now, speaking of geographical representation, you published a diversity in VC report at the end of last year. And one of the findings that you came across was that founders of underrepresented backgrounds are located throughout the country, but heavily concentrated in five states. So New York, California, Washington, D.C., Texas, and Georgia, and 40% coming specifically out of New York alone. So I was a little surprised to see that. I wasn't surprised that there are a lot of underrepresented founders in New York, but surprised at how high that number is. And so just curious as to, were you surprised at those findings at all? Has that affected how and where you invest? And do you think that those findings are representative of the entire national population of underrepresented founders? Or do you think, because obviously your report had a very specific sample. So was that more reflective of the sample that you obtained for your study? So what are your thoughts on that? I would first want to put out a disclaimer that you know these are just observations from our pipeline. Mm-hmm. So we're not trying to extrapolate to all VC deals or all seed and series A deals. Okay. Um, but we think there is a lot of meaning in, in this study itself, though, just despite that. So I guess we weren't necessarily surprised by the results. I mean, we, we had a feeling that because we're based in New York and we have Harlem in our name, we may just attract more founders from that region, especially because you know, that's where our, our networks lie for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were actually happy to see that even though 66% of founders in our study came from those five regions, 
that we still had 28 states represented Mm -hmm. in our study, which meant that there definitely is um, opportunity in these spaces, as well as it means that we're getting reached to these places. And we didn't even do anything um, intentionally to reach all of the U.S., But what it means for us is that we have a solid foundation and that through some more strategic effort, through attending conferences or hosting events in these areas, we can not only get deal flow, but also encourage more founders to start businesses, hopefully in these areas. Okay. So the the founders that were part of the study were those that were already in your pipeline or founders that had reached out to you. So you weren't going out and seeking founders to publish these results. Exactly. And and to be clear, these are people that either submitted, not applications, but requested investment from us or just saw the survey link and decided to fill it out. But it still is representative of our pipeline network and and reach. Okay. And you're also working, I understand, on creating a database of founders from underrepresented backgrounds, your diversity portal. So can you talk a little bit about that methodology, how you're collecting that information, and what you plan to do with the database once it's created? So we're collecting information really by establishing surveys that we host on our website. Mm -hmm. And we're really trying to make sure this reaches as many people as possible by sharing it on social media. I mentioned Brandon and John's followings earlier. And we also hope are hoping that founders share with their following. And so it kind of becomes viral in a way. Mm-hmm. We'll also publish probably medium posts and publications that have a link encouraging people to submit information. But our vision for this portal or database is making it easier for women and minority entrepreneurs to more easily find angels and VCs that are dedicated to diversity. You know, instead of wondering, okay, who's in my area or who are the top 20 funds that have clearly said they want to invest in diverse founders, it's very clear um, and transparent. Because now if you just search for diverse focused VC funds, it, it will take you hours. You still may not really even touch half of them. And so you want to just reduce the frictions and the barriers to entry because by providing more information, we think it's better for, for all parties. Then investors can see more deal flow. And then the entrepreneurs can hopefully have easier access to investors. One more thing. I think we're also trying to make sure we measure the characteristics of this group. So what industries are you in? How old are you? What colleges did you go to? Um, women and male split, ethnicity, et cetera, to really carve out a sense for what does the landscape look like? And we think it's the way to help drive change because we feel like we have to have robust measurements in order to really tell if we're moving the needle and if people are believing in our mission and if we're encouraging more development in the space. You guys have this amazing mission to support underrepresented founders, and you've already begun investing in companies. You have several companies that are part of your portfolio. So can you talk about maybe one or two of the most recent deals that are public, why you invested, and just generally what you're looking for when you bring a company into your portfolio? So two I want to discuss today um, are Blavity and Beauty Bakery. So Blavity, hopefully you're familiar with it. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Great. But for anyone who's not, it's a media platform focused on Black millennials um, in particular. And a reason why we focused and wanted to invest in this company is one, we were users of the platform. We knew that they were a market leader addressing a need that wasn't currently being addressed by established players, really because... BT, Ebony, Black Enterprise really hadn't had enough reach with the millennial community. Mm -hmm. And we also felt that they weren't taking the best advantage of the video format and social media. Mm -hmm. And so Blavity started in 2014 and they were quickly able to become a market leader for this segment of Black millennials. We also felt they had an extremely strong brand and they had significant revenue. Um, But we also saw a path to multiple growth or exponential growth in revenue. Mm-hmm. And lastly, they had a very clear path to an acquisition. And one more thing is that they had a very strong management team. Morgan Devon is amazing. Mm-hmm. And so once we spoke to her and also saw some of her content online, we felt very comfortable with her being a steward of our capital and then growing the business to, to be a huge player. And next, I'll touch on Beauty Bakery. I'll be a, a little shorter, but they're a cosmetics company that makes cruelty-free products predominantly through e-commerce. And they're focused particularly on women of color. Mm. 
And at the time, they had a fantastic brand, very strong social media presence. So over 400,000 followers on Instagram and extremely strong product reviews. Mm -hmm. They had several million in revenue, which has been published online. So I can speak about that briefly. And they're also addressing a, a fragmented industry. So even though there's competition in the beauty space, there's still a lot of opportunity because there's no one player that has, you know, 50% market share. The team was also extremely professional. We felt like they were operating like they were, you know, a $30 million revenue company with levels of management. And they had also been cash flow positive for most of their history. And so not every venture capital firm requires this at this stage of investment, but we thought it was a huge asset to this. And then lastly, we also saw that they had a clear path to an exit for us uh, through an acquisition. Okay. But to get to your other question of what we look for more generally, strong teams are very important with full-time members. We say at least one, but we find that two founders or two manager team members or more are even better. Mm-hmm. We also like the companies to have revenue of greater than $100,000 on an annual basis because it means that the company has found product market fit, They've learned how to monetize, and so we're not taking that risk. It also means that they probably have a path to the next stage of financing. Series A investments usually have an average of a million dollars in revenue. Mm -hmm. And so if they're at that 100K mark, it means that hopefully you can see a a plan and a path to get that next stage within the next two years. We also want to invest in companies where Harlem Capital can actually add value. And so we, we want to make sure if we're an investor, we're not just putting in dollars but we're also getting our hands dirty and able to help improve the value of the investment. We like attractive valuation, so nothing that's priced too high. And then it's really important for us that management invests their own money um, so their incentives are aligned with ours and they they eat their own cooking, Mm. if you will. We also really find it important for the company to have a differentiated product or offering in an underserved market. And then lastly... I've touched on this before, but a clear path to exit. Our target exit or um, investment realization is four to seven years, which is, we think, a little bit shorter than the seven to 10 years on average it takes for a venture capital investment to get realized. Now, one of the things you talked about was companies where you feel like you can add value. So can you talk a little bit about what you think your sweet spot is in terms of the things that you think you can uniquely offer to founders and the kind of support you like to provide? So we think we're particularly good at helping out with financial analysis, looking at the company's files and figuring out, okay, are our margins as good as they could be? Where are we burning cash? Is our working capital effective, if you will? We think that we're uniquely positioned because of our private equity experience to dig into the numbers, analyze trends, and help drive operational and financial improvements in the business. Also, we're good at helping our portfolio companies improve their processes. So because we worked in larger organizations, we've seen technology platforms and infrastructure platforms implemented or even just better use of technical tools that can decrease any inefficiencies and help the business become more effective. So we think those are two areas we're particularly good at. I think also on the fundraising side, we're able to help our companies realize what's in their best interest. So where should you price your round? Um, how much ownership should you seek to retain? Because we've seen, unfortunately, sad stories where companies have damaged their capital structure. And now it's going to be tough for that company to either provide a return for their investors or incentives for the management team to to keep working. Because if you basically give up too much of your ownership and management doesn't own enough, they don't have as much upside should the business get bought out or something of that nature. Right. And then lastly, I mentioned our social media presence a couple of times throughout this conversation. But we feel like we're particularly good at using the video format and by building social media audiences. And so as a result, in the particularly consumer-facing businesses that we've invested in, we're able to help bring that expertise and help them improve their followings and hopefully generate sales that way. Now, one of the things that has come up in a lot of conversations I've had with prior guests is that underrepresented founders oftentimes don't have access to the education about the venture capital process, you know, how to pitch, what VCs are looking for. So in your interactions with founders that maybe have come to you looking for fundraising, what are some of the common misconceptions or mistakes that founders have made in the process? And if an educational program were put together, and I know that there are some that exist, to educate 
educate minority and female founders on how to go through the process, what are some of the things that it should cover? So there's tons of things I can focus on. I'll try to keep it <laughs> on the brief side today. Okay. But I think one mistake that founders have done that I've seen is underestimating how long fundraising can take. Hmm. So for startups, it can be well over six months for a, a round of financing. And so structuring that fundraising process accordingly, but also making sure you have enough business and cash flow runway to make it there will be in their best interest. But it's tough. I mean, but at, at every level, I think people underestimate fundraising, how long it will take, um, even funds themselves. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, being very, very, very conservative and talking to other founders who have had successful businesses and seeing how long it's taken them is key. I think also it's important to either have invested their own money or at least proven that they're fully committed to this mission. So had they left their job already, I know everybody can't do that, but if you are focused full time on your endeavor, it will provide a very strong signal to investors that, hey, you're committed to this. You're willing to live modestly for a while and you're not going to bail as soon as you receive the money, especially if something goes wrong with the business. Mm. Also, we've seen founders underestimating the people in HR part of their businesses. So not building out your team where you have key people and key functional areas and and having key gaps. Like we've seen companies where there's a, a CEO that is maybe decent at sales, but is not good at marketing or doesn't have a handle on the numbers. And so either they need to get that core competency or find someone who does have that competency because otherwise as an investor, you're just nervous that they're not going to make it to the next round or they're going to have a lot of challenges. Mm. I think also another mistake that I've seen founders have, and we've been particularly focused on this for women and diverse entrepreneurs, is not exuding enough passion and confidence in their business. And we've seen majority founders who don't have a good business at all be extremely confident. And we think that we, as underrepresented minorities need to have that same or even a greater level of confidence. Um, because if you don't believe in your business and are able to sell that it's the best thing ever, investors aren't going to be able to, to get on board because as investors, we're already going to discount whatever you're saying. And so you have to start out by being very confident in your business. Mm. On the flip side, though, we find it extremely important for founders to be self-aware. And so even if you're confident, you don't want to be overconfident to the point where you're saying things that aren't true or downplaying weaknesses of your business. You have to acknowledge that, hey, I don't, I can't do everything right or I can't Mm -hmm. foresee everything, but this is still a good opportunity. And then also to that point, we've seen some founders be defensive when we start asking them questions about their business. And I think they have to understand that when you seek other people's money, they have the ability to ask all the questions they want, hopefully in a reasonable fashion. Yeah. You have to just see that as interest and as a way to improve rather than, you know, an attack on you personally. Mm. And so being able to handle those questions without being defensive or getting frustrated is a a very important thing. And I also would just want to make some recommendations in general that I didn't touch on. I think it's important for founders to know their business as well as their numbers cold. So not hesitating when you when you get asked those questions, making sure that your products and services are differentiated. And also knowing what competitors exist. Some people say, hey, there's no competitors in my market, which is very rarely true. (laughs) And so having a good handle on who those competitors are, what their names are, how big they are, who's invested in them is is key. Being open to feedback is extremely, an extremely um, good trait to have. Also, when you're fundraising, it's important to create a sense of urgency. And so you don't want to just send out your materials or make a pitch and then say, hey, you can come back to me whenever. You need to say like, hey, you have to get back to me in two weeks or three weeks to create a sense of urgency to really help increase demand for for what you're offering. And then last thing, I think follow-up is key for people that are seeking to raise money. So every now and then, some investors will go radio silent, but you need to make sure to follow up um, until you get an answer out of them. But to that point, it's probably best to do so when you have meaningful updates. So rather than saying, hey, I just want to make sure you saw my email any questions saying, hey, well, we close these three new business accounts or we have, you know, a hundred new customers or we're launching this new product is a pretty good way to 
encourage interest and to help close your your financing round. Yeah, I think a lot of founders would probably forget that you're seeing many entrepreneurs, right, on a weekly or monthly basis. And so it's easy to get lost in the shuffle, I guess. Absolutely. So what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you and to learn more about Harlem Capital Partners? Sure. Thanks for asking. The best way is to go either to our website, harlem.capital. It's pretty easy to find. Or you can Google Harlem Capital and it'll be you know, one of the first links that'll come up. Separately, they can email us or, or very responsive to email at info at harlem.capital. And that's pretty much it. We, we really look forward to connecting with, with founders and people interested in joining our mission. We also are on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn. So any platform there is, you can find us on there as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoy speaking with you. Thank you for all of your insights and advice for founders looking for funding. It was my pleasure. Great to chat with you as well. Thank you. For all of you out there listening, thank you so much for joining me this week. You can find the links to everything we talked about today in my show notes at goodbyteventures.com. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please reach out to me on Twitter at TechForwardPod or on Instagram at TechForwardPodcast. Remember, you can also connect with me by signing up for my newsletter at goodbyteventures.com slash tech dash forward dash podcast. That's bite with a Y. If you enjoy the Tech Forward podcast, please share a link with your friends over on the social media channels where you're most active. Also, please do consider writing a review of the show on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to the show. Reviews and social shares are one of the best ways for new listeners to find us. Thank you again for listening. See you next week.